down at your feet, oh Lord, is the most high place in your presence, Lord. I see your face, I see. In your presence, 
God. We are preparing ourselves for your reign. The showers of blessing. The showers of your presence. The showers of your guidance. The showers of your direction. We prepare ourselves as a sanctuary. A dwelling place for you. Because you said in your word that the Christ in us will be the hope of glory for the world around us. Lord, we are truly desiring to fear your name. So God, in these next few days, as we consecrate ourselves and sanctify ourselves to be your sanctuary, be your dwelling place that your will, your purpose, may be accomplished in us my lord and god i pray that you be attentive to our prayers that we hear our supplications you will grant our petitions that at the end of the day your name will be glorified we honor you we bless you we thank you for the privilege to be called your children Thank you for our time together this morning and in the days to come. We bless you now and we praise your name forever in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Praise God. Again, we want to welcome everyone to this first Sunday of 2013. So we say, Happy New Year to everyone. And we pray that your dreams and your expectations for this new year will not be frustrated. On that note, I want to thank our young, young, young people for encouraging our hearts. <laughs> they sent a very wonderful signal for us that 2013 will be a great year. I want to thank all those that work with the children. Thank you so much for your labor of love, your hard work, your commitment, your diligence. We know it's not easy. We really truly appreciate you. And on that note, if you are encouraged by what you see, I'm sure they can need some more help. Amen. Hallelujah. They are always hiring. Amen. Children's ministry is always hiring. Amen. We bless the love for everyone. Just on a very quick note before we get into the message this morning, uh, Pastor Ibiki did an excellent job. That guy, I tell you what, I, I don't know what to do, man. Uh, listen, I have, I have a couple of dollars uh, that, that has your name on it. He did an excellent job reminding us of the fast that's coming on. I just want to highlight one or two things. Number one, again, I want to say that I'm encouraging everyone to be here every day to pray. Now, let me just clarify one thing. I'm not expecting or asking everyone to fast for 52 days. Clarification. All of us will fast for the first seven days. All of us will participate when our groups are fasting. And I want to encourage you to go beyond that and choose a day or two every week during the fast to also continue to fast. But I am not by any means asking everybody to fast for 52 days. Let it be known on Fox News, on CNN, and CBS, ABC, and NBC. Amen. Those of you that are desirous, it's an open game. But minimally, we should all do the first seven days. Then you should participate with your house church when they are fasting. And those of us that are looking for more to discover in God can choose an additional one or two days every week or three days every week to continue to fast. But I'm saying that all the 52 days, I'm not asking coach all of you <laughs> to fast every day for the 52 days. Amen? Use wisdom. Amen. Now, we know that we have young children in the congregation. I want to encourage parents, begin to encourage your young ones about the discipline of fasting. Amen. However, Amen. however, 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 let parental wisdom and guidance be the instrument to know what to do with your children. I'm not coming to your kitchen or your house to tell you what to do. I'm asking you to teach them the discipline of fasting and encourage them to fast in some way. Perhaps no texting, no TV, uh, no snacks, something, something to just help them understand 
that this is not seasoned as usual. But I'm leaving that discretion to you as parents to know what to do with your own children. Are you getting it? Are you hearing what I'm saying? All right. Now, those of us that are under medical care, I said this before, I want to say this again. You are not under any compelling to fast except that you get the advice or the consultation of your physician. Are you hearing me? I don't want the enemy to use a good thing to cause a snare for any of us. So if you're under medical care, consult your physicians. Now, as far as praying every day, the doors will be open half an hour before the exact praying time. In other words, we pray on Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. to 7.30. The doors will be open at 6.30 p.m. for the early campus. Amen? 6.30, the church doors will be open and ready on Monday to Friday at 6.30 p.m. and on Saturday at 4.30 before we pray at 5 p.m. Now, the question has been asked, how about those that want to break every day? When should we break? Should we break at 3? Should we break at 12 noon? I, say, I mean, so I'm amazed sometimes the kind of questions, I mean, we're talking about matter of life and death, the questions people ask. However, because you asked, here is the answer. For those that will break every day, do so between 5 and 6 p.m. Amen? All other questions be directed to God. Amen. Thank you very much. That was a very coded message. But those of you that are asking, you know what, what I'm talking about. But anyway. All right, so let's move forward this morning as we begin, oh, we begin to prepare ourselves for these 52 days. And for those of you that want to go ahead of me, you can begin to read again from the book of Nehemiah, the entire chapters of the book of Nehemiah. We're going to be teaching and speaking from these books quite a bit over the next few weeks. So this morning, I'm going to do a message that I'm calling Preparing to Build the Wall. Preparing to build the wall. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 1. Preparing to build the wall. Beginning from verse 1 again, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, as I was in Sushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the cap captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are, in, who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burnt with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I was sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And really, it will not, I want to encourage, for those of you that were not here last Sunday, get the tip. It is going to be very difficult in the time that I have every Sunday to really be able to address the previous message before we move forward. So I really strongly want to encourage you, get the tip. And, for, and just so you know, for those of you that may not be here, maybe you're traveling on Sunday mornings, all of these messages you can stream live on the website. I'm getting feedbacks from that already. You know, so I just want you to know if you're traveling and you need to just uh, catch on to what's going on at work, friend, just log on. You can watch these messages live on the web. Now, very interesting here. Let me just, let me just begin here by saying some things about, uh, uh, I can't go back to the context. It's too much stuff. But notice what Nehemiah said here in Nehemiah chapter 1 in verse 4. The very last sentence. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. In most other places in scripture, God is described as the God of heaven and earth. But in this particular verse, Nehemiah describes God as the God of heaven totally omitted the earth portion. Why? 
Because at this particular time in writing, in the history of Israel, the witness of God in the earth was so diminished that you almost could say that God was a non-factor, even though we know he's a factor. So he said, you know what? I'm acknowledging that we have messed up so much. The light of God, the glory of God, the salt that we should be on the earth, all of the things that we as a church should be on the earth, the nation of Israel, the custodians of God's promises, the custodian of God's oracle, the one who had been in covenant with God. I'm acknowledging that we have not done our part, and therefore, God is not seen as he ought to be seen. As we go on this 52-day fast, I want to remind us and to challenge us to ask ourselves these very probing questions. Am I a living, active witness of God in my community? Am I a living, acting, I mean, living, active witness of God on my job, in my school, in my house, in my nation, on the earth? These are very legitimate questions. Because if we, as, if we as believers lose that light and we lose the salt and lose the influence, then truly we are like Lehman, we can say, the God of heaven. Because that means his activity on the earth is no longer relevant. God forbid that we will ever get to that point in Jesus' name. So as we move forward in this message this morning, I'm preparing to build the walls, let me first talk to us about Nehemiah, one of the key agents that God is using to have this done. This entire book is a powerful book on leadership. But not only is it a great book for leadership, it is also a great book to teach and to encourage me and you on our warfare as a believer. And that's the aspect we're going to really focus on for the most part as we move forward. But we cannot ignore who Nehemiah is and some attributes of him that contributed to his success. Number one, Nehemiah was a man of great vision. He had great and big vision. And I want to challenge us, if your vision is, uh, if, if you alone by yourself can accomplish your vision, it's not a big vision. If on your own effort, in your own strength, you can get it done, it is not a big vision at all. Imagine what Nehemiah, had, Nehemiah was doing here. He was tackling a problem of over 150 years. How many men and women have come and gone in 150 years that nobody dared to touch it? Because they thought it was a no-go. And here came this man on this and said, you know what? I am sick of tired and sick of tired of hearing that the people of God are in distress, the walls are broken down, the gates are burned with fire. I am going to be an instrument in God's hand to do something about it. Many of us come from far away lands to come to this great United States of America. We come from the Caribbean, we come from Africa, we come from Latin America. We come from all over the world to come to this great country. And when we hear of the report of our homeland, we complain, we murmur, we grumble. But unlike Nehemiah, we have not risen to the task to understand that me and you, even though we are here in the United States, in order to change things in our homeland, we must join the struggle by having a bigger vision for these homelands. It doesn't take anything to complain. All you need is a mouth. But it takes a large heart to connect with the heart of God and to see the solution to every problem in all these nations. Let me say this to us. These homelands, these nations, from which we've all come to this great nation, United States, will never be fixed until God has some Nehemiahs that have gone out of those nations. Ha! 
living in a place like the United States or somewhere else in the West, taking the resources, learning the, uh, the, 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 the skills, and then like Nehemiah, become a leader to lead the restoration back to your homeland. If you don't volunteer yourself, you will only read bad news on CNN every day. And nothing will change. So I'm saying to you, God is looking for a few good men and women who will recognize that the problems in these nations can be resolved by you and I resolving to be the agents of change. Big vision. A vision to restore and to correct a problem of over 150 years. So that's number one in leadership. You must see beyond others. You must see better than others. And you must see farther than others around you. Number one profile on Nehemiah as a leader. Secondly, secondly, Nehemiah understood that any great work can never be done alone. Any great work can never be accomplished alone. A leader's job is to influence others. Now, please pay attention to see how serious this is. Notice that when Nehemiah went to rebuild, when he left Persia to go back to Jerusalem, notice he did not take builders with him from Persia. It was the same people who were in distress, who had lived in that condition for over 100 years, who were already content to be in distress. Those were the same people that Nehemiah now influenced to change their paradigm. The same people with whom mediocrity had become normal. The same people with whom Disaster became the way of living. When Neymar in his leadership stepped on the scene, they didn't have to import fresh laborers, fresh skilled men. They didn't have to do that. He just simply challenged those same individuals who had thought being broke was normal to begin to see a new light. That's what leadership does. Leadership is the ability to influence others to do the things they would otherwise not do. That's how you know when you're growing as a leader. When you're able to carry people along and influence them to do the things they normally would not have done. Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem and used the same individuals who were content to be broke, to be in disaster, to be in distress, to be in reproach, to be in shame, and said to them, you are better than this. Folks, that's our message to the world. To be able to look at the situation and say, you know what, Greg, you are better than this. You can do this. You have more significance in you. God can do this through you. That's the message of leader. Number three, number three, number three, and this is going to get us deep into the message this morning. Number three, in Nehemiah's leadership. Number three was that he was adequately prepared for the challenges. He was adequately prepared for the challenges. There is no such thing as building new walls, restoring the gates, and no opposition. I don't want you to imagine for one second that this next 52 days is going to be hunky-dory for you. Let me sound you the alarm in advance. The minute you begin to desire to honor God, that, minute, that same minute, hell immediately puts your name on the radar and has a dart with your name on it. You need to understand that. You need to understand that. Every, any of us that will say, you know what, I want to do something good for God. The minute you really mean it, that minute, hell takes notice. It was Red Path that, said this, that made this statement. I want to read it. It says, there's no winning without warfare. There is no opportunity without opposition. And there's no victory without vigilance. Red path. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
The moment you seek to attempt something great for God, you need to understand all opposition arises. Because the enemy's job is to keep me and you at status quo. Existing state of affairs. Where broke becomes normal. Where poverty is usual. Where being ill health is normal. Where everything going around you that's terrible and bad, you just say, well, after a while it will change, but do nothing about it. Are you hearing me this morning? Now, I want to show us three key enemies that oppose Nehemiah that will be seeking to oppose us. And may I just send a warning to those enemies, they will not win. Amen. They will not win because the battle has been won on our behalf. And greater is he that dwells in us than he that's in the world. Yes. Victory already belongs to us. Amen. We are just the enforcers of that which has already been done. Amen. I want to make that absolutely clear. I'm not glorifying the devil. I'm not giving him any more, any more time. Than this. It's just that you and I need to know certain things. Because for too long, many of us do not fully recognize the foes that we're fighting. Three main oppositions. Number one, you read this in Nehemiah chapter 2. Let me just, uh, where do I start? Verse 19. Nehemiah 2, 19. But when Sambalat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard of it, what did they hear? They heard of the fact that we are attempting to build a wall. That's what they heard here. When they heard that Nehemiah actually came seeking to do something about the distress and the walls that were broken down. When they heard, look at what the Bible says. They laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? Notice that king there, small k. Small K. The enemy is laughing right now. I want to come 52 day fast. Oh, 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 oh. Before, before, before 10 a.m. on Monday, you'll be eating chicken and french fries. And, uh, uh. Oh, yes. You, you fast for 52 days. Before two hours of the fast, you'll see what I'll do with you. You smell coffee, you, you feel like, man, I've never smelled coffee this good. It's another laughing. What the enemy does not know is that you are not doing this in your own strength, Amen. by your own power. Oh, hallelujah! He has totally forgotten the grace factor. God's enablement. Hallelujah! Helping us to do that which we cannot ordinarily do. Absolutely. That's what the enemy is forgetting in this equation. Three main oppositions. Number one, and the most prominent of all the oppositions is this dude named Sambalat. Please don't name your child Sambalat. <laughs> Sambalat means hatred in secret. That's the meaning of his name. And as you will see in a moment, because I'm going to show you a chart, as you see in a moment, you see how it works. But before I get there, let me just say this to you. It is very interesting. His name means hatred in secret. He was the main man behind most of the attacks. He was very wealthy. He had a lot of influence, a lot of power and control. And he stands for our biggest enemy, Satan. Now, I don't want to give you statistics, but, but I have a survey here that totally mind-blowing about how believers perceive Satan. 52% of born-again believers perceive Satan as just an evil force. No, as a symbol of an evil force. 
But I want to tell you this money is more than that. And again, I'm saying this just so I can inform you, because to not be informed will be to run into a blind, into, into a wall with, that, with your eyes not opened. You need to understand we are fighting a formidable foe. Our hope and our chance to defeat him is not in us, but in him who has already defeated him. It's a defeated man. But let me just touch on this for a minute. I may not even go beyond these three main enemies this morning because this is important. It's interesting for me that the name means hatred in secret. Even though in Nehemiah's days, he came out openly and tried to attack Nehemiah, to stop Nehemiah, to persecute Nehemiah, and to be a hindrance and an obstacle to his progress. So in praying and pondering, I said, God, why would, you, why would this guy's name mean hatred in secret? Then I got it. You see, in the book of Luke, I believe in chapter 4. Yes, chapter 4, verse 8. A very interesting thing happened. In fact, let's read it. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. I don't want to have to rush this. What I don't finish, I pick up later. But look at Luke chapter 4. Oh, no, 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 this is not what I'm looking for. Oh, my goodness. Wrong scripture. Okay, but I can quote it. Jesus is telling his disciples about how he was going to go to the cross and die. And Peter, the Bible said, rebuked Jesus. I said, no, this would not happen to you. What are you talking about? You are the Messiah, the God of the earth. Notice what Jesus did. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. Wait a minute. Is Jesus aware that Satan is in the heavenlies? Is Jesus aware that Peter, Simon Peter, the rock upon which the church will be built, is he aware that Simon Peter is not Satan in the flesh? And yet, he rebukes Peter and says, get thee behind me, Satan. He didn't come call him Peter. I'm about to tell you something. Because I told you this a week ago. About how when we come to church on Sunday morning, Satan also comes. Oh, he's here this morning. But he'll get delivered. Peter is one of the leaders of the church. And yes, Jesus looked at him and said, he did not say, get thee behind me, Peter. No. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, before I show Satan to you, let me take you to a couple of, couple of scriptures. This is important. It's because you need to know who you are fighting against. Or shall I say, who is fighting against you? Go to Revelation chapter 12. I'm not talking about Revelation Walker. Revelation chapter 12. Hatred in secret. That's his name. The biggest danger to you and I is the things that are in secret that we don't know. People like Peter who's with you but not with you. They marching with you to the battle, but in their heart, they are way over there. So Jesus had to tell him, get thee behind me, Satan. Because you do not know the things of God. Folks, the devil you can see is no problem. You're looking at him, you know how to deal with him or her. But the ones that say, oh, pastor, we are together. Don't worry, pastor, go ahead and do it. I'm with you, pastor. I will never leave you. I'm with you, pastor. Okay. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. So that great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ have come. 
for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. Who is Satan? Is an adversary? Is a slanderer? Is an accuser? Accuser? And what I'm saying to you this morning, you need to understand this. Hated in secret, Sambalat's name. If you and I engage in any activity to accuse another brother, you are Satan. Let, let me let, I, I, let, let me let that. I, I can feel that dropping. Let it settle down. You see, Satan is not just a person or a place. It is also a position or an office. That's why Jesus could look at Peter and say, get thee behind me, Satan. Why? Because in that moment, Peter was resisting what Jesus was saying. So in that instant, for that moment, it was Satan. Whenever you allow yourself to be drawn into a situation where you slander a brother, you are Satan. You accuse a brother, you are Satan. You stand in opposition to a brother or sister, you are Satan. End of story, period. Bam. Did you not just see the scripture? First Peter 5 8, be sober and vigilant. Your adversary, who? The devil. So if I'm in an adversarial position to a brother or sister over any situation, I become an adversary to that person. In that instant, I've occupied the office of what? Say it. <laughs> On that note, how many satanic people are here this morning? <laughs> Nobody will answer me this morning. Because I'm bringing revelation to the world. This is why Sabbath's name means hatred in secret. I'm telling coach how I love him. How he's my brother. But I go to Kuna and say, that guy, he has no clue what he's doing. <laughs> In that instant, he thinks I'm with him, but the truth is I'm behind his back, slandering him, accusing him, opposing him, being adversarial to him. I'm certain. You need to know this. We are about to engage into a 52-day fast. Don't become certain to your husband or to your wife or to your children, to your employer or to your co-workers. Nobody has made you and I an accuser of another brother. I can give you more scriptures. Zechariah chapter 1. Verse 1. Joshua the high priest was before God. And the Bible said that Satan, S-A-T-A-N, came and began to accuse and oppose him before God. That's the work of Satan. That's what, see, listen, the devil is not omnipresent. In other words, he's not everywhere all of the time. He's looking for agents. Agents that will do his bidding, that he will use to carry out his agenda. And unfortunately, he's found too many of them in the house of God. I'm very careful to open my mouth to accuse anybody because I know exactly what it means. I'm very careful not to be adversarial to anybody because I know what it means. I'm very, very careful not to even in the careless of ways to slander anyone because in the spirit is registered something. It registers something. So number one opposition here is Satan. And I'm going to show you in a moment how it works. I have a chart that will help you see how these things work. Number two enemy that we should be all concerned about is a man by the name of Geshem. And you saw that as well in Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 9. Geshem. Geshem means that which is physical, tangible, or material that which is physical tangible or material so Geshem speaks to us of the world around us or in short worldliness 
worldliness. Cars, houses, luxurious vacations, nice things. All of these things are physical, they are tangible, they are material. You can see them, feel them, smell them, snuff them. Many of us are not able to build our walls because of Geshem. Amen? The last one of these enemies of Nehemiah is the man by the name of Tobiah. I'm praying and hoping none of you will name any of your children Sambalat, Geshem, or Tobiah. Now, Tobiah's name actually has a great meaning to it. Tobiah's name means Jehovah is good. Jehovah is good. Now, this is where, the, this, is where this thing gets tricky. Seemingly a very strange name for someone who so vigorously opposes Jehovah's chosen people. In all of his operations, Tobiah will show himself as a third enemy. And it means for me and you, the old Adam, the flesh. The flesh, the old Adam. Tobiah speaks of the sinful nature that not only does bad, hear me now, listen to what I'm about to say. It speaks of the sinful nature that does not only do bad things, but also has a tendency to do good. And it seeks a lot of God's people by the good things he does. Ah, let like that rest a little bit. Because I know we had a, a very vigorous discussion here months ago about people that was doing good deeds. Nice philanthropic deeds that they're doing. And it gets confusing. Because how do you say that a man that's helping with uh, 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 funding uh, AIDS cure can be a bad person? They're doing a good thing. But in the light of the totality of scriptures, we now understand what those good things are. In context with God, they are Tobiah. Jehovah is good. They do good things. And the good things they do, do not allow me and you to see the evil beneath the good. It's easy to get carried away with what we see as the fig leaves or the good things and don't understand the fact that anyone that's not born again, I don't care how you look at it, is bad. There's none, no one that's good except God. So it's not what they do per se, it's the nature of who they are that defines who they are. Do you get that? Because to buy here, you're going to see as we get into this story, I'm telling you, this guy is a serious mixture. It's a serious mixture. And if you're not discerning, you hear what he's saying, you see what he's trying to do, and you think, man, you're a good partner, man. Come on in. And when you bring them in, you just brought in old Adam. Slide smack into your living room. Hello, somebody. Now, let me show us how they come together in this story by going to the parable of the sower. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. At this time, I'm going to need my overhead. Mark chapter 4. The parable of the sower. I'm going to begin from verse 2. Then he taught them many things by parables, and he said to them in his teaching, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside. And the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of the earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased, and produced some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. Very interesting. So here Jesus tells a parable, giving us four kinds 
of Saul. And you're going to see this in the email beginning from chapter 4. When the walls are not built, when the walls are still broken down and the gates still burnt, that condition describes a believer that you are looking at right here. Believer number one. The seed fell on the roadside. What's the trouble? The birds of the air came and ate the seeds. Now, you know what I like about scriptures? Scripture interprets itself. When you first read the birds of the air came and ate the seed, if you're not careful, you just bet, oh, wow, these are birds, like a puppy parrot that you put in your house, parrot. No. Look at what Jesus said in Mark chapter 4. In verse 15, no, verse 14, Mark 4, 14. Look at what it says. The sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, what comes immediately? Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. When he first told the parable, he said, birds of the air. So, birds of the air equals Satan. Because he just interpreted it for you. Do you guys see that? No, 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 no. You guys, the way you're look, looking at me. Uh, did you guys see that? Go back to Mark 4, please. Verse 2. No, verse 4. And it happened, as he sowed, that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. But by the time you get to verse 15, it lets you know what the birds of the air is. It's Satan. That's Satan. Now go back to my chart. This is what happens. If our lives are without walls, no defenses, no protection, no security, no discipline, what happens is we're hearing the word. And in this condition, remember Proverbs 25? I think verse 18, that talks about how a, uh, uh, a strong city that is without walls. No, a city that is without walls. It's like a town that is broken down. When we're in this condition, you can come to church 365 days a year. Jesus preaches to you. Paul preaches to you. Peter preaches to you. John, Kenneth Hagin comes up from the dead and preaches to you. Elijah preaches to you. Elisha preaches to you. All of the preachers preach. You hear the word, nothing happens. You know why? No words and Satan is your, is your friend. Immediately, and you, listen, I'm sharing this with you because as we go into this first, you need to evaluate yourself. Is that you? Are you hard of hearing when it comes to the word of God? When it comes to spiritual things, are you always having difficulty in understanding it? Because the same you that do not understand the word, you understand the most complex gadget on the face of this earth. You can fix and work on any gadget. It has no, you have no problem. Whereas, uh, what, what, what do they have these days? I don't even know what they have iPad number four, or, or, or Google, or whatever it is, I, iMac, what, what, whatever the gadget is, you are the master of it. I went to a movie with my son a while back, Sherlock Holmes. I had no clue what they were saying in the movie. First, <laughs> pinch me. Are you out with that? I said, yeah, okay, okay. I have no clue. No clue. But those kids, him and my grandson, they understood the thing perfectly. And I'm saying, wow, deep. <laughs> but we come to church for crowd loud. The word of God that comes to us in simplicity and clarity. And we can't get a grip of it. I'm saying to you, don't settle and accept that as normal. You are under a satanic influence. Get delivered from it. Get delivered from it. That's what happened. Sit number one. 
The word comes, oh wow, man, Ada, did you enjoy the word today? That was powerful, Ada. My God. Then Ada says, what did you hear? Oh, <laughs> I just know it was good. It was real good. You cannot recall one thing that was said, but it was good. Satanic influence. Because Satan knows you can be born again all you want, as long as the seed does not stay in you. No manifestation. No manifestation of divine life, of divine power. No manifestation of God kind of life. Because the only God kind of life that will be produced in us is what the seed has been deposited in us. These 52 days, I'm telling you, don't take that for granted. Face that head on. Sambalat is at work. Hatred in secret. He does not want you to prosper the things of God. He wants you to understand everything else but the word of God. Don't settle for that. If God speaks the word, he wants you to know it. Don't settle for anything less than that. Seed number two. Seed number two. That's the seed that fell in rocky places. Rocky places. The trouble with that is when the sun comes hard on these rocky places. The Bible says in Mark chapter 4 that it's scourges the soil. And when Jesus explained the parable, he told us what that meant. He said it means persecution. Let's go back to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. It says, verse 16, these likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. That's seed number two. Rocky places. Persecution comes. Even though they receive the word immediately. But as you read in Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 7 through 15, at this stage, when this attack came, the walls were only half built. Half built. Half the height. And so what happens? Tobiah, the persecutor, the ones that does good and does bad, that confuses us, we don't know whether it's right or wrong. Uh, he's a good man, he's a bad, you don't, because he, he's very sleek. He's the one that leads persecution. Persecution always comes through human beings. When a wall is only half built, the enemy has in road, can still jump over the wall and bring attack upon you. Persecution. You hear the word of God, but something happens. They lay off people in your job, and all of a sudden you lose your faith. Because your words are not all the way up yet. To buy a ministry is a work. You need to confront that in these 52 days. You must tell Tobiah, no more. No more. No more. No more. Number three, ground. That one fell on thorns. Still in Mark chapter 4. And even though it started to grow, the thorns also grew along with it. And the explanation Jesus gave in Mark chapter 4 here, verse 18. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. What, 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 why, why, why is the word not prospering? Now, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things entering in choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. That's Geshem ministry. Remember I told you about Geshem? It's physical, it's tangible, it's material. Physical in that, yes, you can see the cares of this world. You understand the deceitfulness of riches. You can touch riches and the desire for other things. Now, we're not saying riches is bad and that the desire for other things is bad. When they interfere with your ability to grow in the things of God, that's when it becomes bad. Are you hearing me? So in this case here, the wall is actually full 
And you see this in Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. The wall is completely up. You know what the problem is? The gates are not in place. The gates are not in place. What does that mean? Translation for me and you, lack of discipline. The walls are all the way up. I know what's right and what's wrong. I know I'm aware of that. I know what God wants me to do. But there are no gates. No gates, meaning no discipline to say no to the devil. To say no to my flesh. To say no to the things that I know are detrimental for me, even though I know it. And I'm doing it with full knowledge that what I'm doing will hurt me later. I've never seen a thing like this. We're on cigarettes. They put the warning. Warning! The solicitor, I mean, the, the Surgeon General has determined that this is bad for your health. And people put my bottle. Oh, then they start to cover your head. <laughs> Surgeon General said, smoking this will kill you. Oh, hallelujah. Mm. It's cool. It's crazy. That's what's happening here. Number four. Number four. Number four. Number four ground. The seed fell on good soil. There is no trouble. But what we need to know about this good ground is it takes time and patience. It takes time and patience. You don't get to become good soil in one day. It takes time of consistently doing the right things. And then you get there. But the good thing about getting there is when you do get there, the walls are completed. The gates are in place. And even your enemies will have to acknowledge this is the work of God. Oh, hallelujah. That's where I want us to go on this for today. Now, after it's all said and done, the enemy will come and testify. Abba, coach, I tried to stop you. I tried to hinder you. I tried to discourage you. I tried everything I know to do. I brought all the hosts of demonic forces in hell. You are still standing. Amen. You are still standing. This must be none other than the work of God in your life. This all I, I see it. I acknowledge it. I praise God for it. Amen. That's why God is taking us. It's not just for us. It's so that the world may know there's a God in Israel, that there's a God in the church, that there's a God at work fam, that there's a God in your life, there's a God in your family, there's a God in your household, that no matter what the enemy throws at you, they've already thrown it at your bigger brother. Hallelujah. And your bigger brother has already defeated the devil. His resume, his CV, his failure. He failed then, he's failing now, he forever failed. The world is forever settled in your favor. You are a winner. You are an overcomer. You are a victorious one. You cannot fail. Hallelujah! All of the resources of heaven are beyond your success. You will succeed. You will make progress. You will glorify God. You will praise his name. You are triumphant. Hallelujah! Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. The devil has not seen anything yet. God has kept the best for the last. Hallelujah. The generation of people that will show this earth the manifestation of the sons of God. You are that generation. You are the chosen generation. You are the holy royal priesthood. The holy nation. The peculiar treasure. Amen? Amen? So as we go into this fast, do so by doing proper accounting. Take an assessment of where you are. Not to condemn yourself. No. But a wise builder, Jesus said, you count the cost before you start. As a wise builder, God, where am I? What are the things that the enemy is using against my progress. Where do I need to make amends? Which walls do I need to be building? What gates do I need to be putting in place? Don't just let this be a dieting exercise. Let it be a fasting and praying 
exercise where when at the end of 52 days we can come back together and say you know what the walls are in place the gates are in place and the great god of the universe we get the honor and the glory through our lives and so father we want to thank you this morning for the awesome privilege of being called into your kingdom for such a time as this thank you father for giving us the desire to want to do something about what you've already done for us we recognize that it's not going to be by might not by power but by your spirit so i pray over this entire congregation that as we desire to seek you and to fast and pray over this next 52 days something we have never done before that you god will take us by the hand you will chop our call our course you will lead us by the way you allow your discernment to work in and through us that you show each and every one of us the areas where we have to be building the amends we have to make let this not just be another dieting exercise but god be glorified be honored and praised in heaven and on the earth as a result of what you will do in us and for us and through us i commend every member of this church to you that the enemy will not ensnare any one of us in any way form or shape father in the name of jesus there will be no condemnation no guilt on anyone for any reason whatsoever father god in the name of jesus we acknowledge you as our god our father and the one that's leading and guiding us thank you father god i bless you i honor you i praise your name forever thank you lord for this season and occasion 52 days of Nehemiah fast that when it's all said and done the world around us they will say what they said about Nehemiah and his people that yes only God could have done this and magnify and glorify your name thank you father we honor you now and bless you forever in Jesus name amen, amen. let's give it up to Jesus let's give it up let's give it up let's give it up